Now I was preparing for you all who hopefully you were expecting and hoping that uh, you are ready for a challenge by me, which is going to be my some of my biggest milestones in my life, in my personal life, and also, of course, on chess. So I'd like to share with you some of the stories and uh, you maybe don't know necessarily all of it. And I hope there will be also some uh, different uh, positions which you have never seen before. Anyway, I'm happy that you're here and that you take off with me with this journey. So, well, actually, this is a big milestone in my life. I was born, I'm, you can see uh, me in my mother's hand. I have two sisters and I was born in 1976, quite some, some time ago. And uh, it was very special at that time. I didn't understand and didn't know that when I was born, my parents decided already that I'm going to be a chess champion. So that's how I started. After that, it was, uh, I was about five years old when I started to play chess as both of my sister played already. And they were actually pretty good. Susan is seven and a half year older than I am. So it was very exciting that uh, practically the pacifier was chess piece for me. It was so natural for me to follow up on my sister's career. Of course, Sophia, a year and a half older, she was also, of course, clearly playing chess already. And she was, of course, quite a long time, she was quite ahead of me. But chess became very fast an international language for me. I mean, not international, but the mother language. And then, of course, when I started to travel all over the world, it was, uh, it became, and I believe that it's a language for all of us. As a chess tournament, I believe it's a language of chess. So I'd like to show you some of the examples I had. And this is a, a position from my childhood, which I wanted to challenge you that it, we had a lot of trainings. It was usually in the morning, in the afternoon. And of course, I started to play chess uh, 10 minutes, 20 minutes. My mother taught me the move. Later on, it was increasing the time I was playing uh, chess. And of course, in the beginning, it was only a game. It's no question about it. But later on, I was six years old when I won the first uh, uh, tournament. It was around the block <laughs> somehow adult people were playing already. And I remember I was collecting a small pocket chess set with magnetic pieces. And, uh, but to improve in chess, of course, you have to train a lot, which not necessarily everybody agrees or everybody thinks how much you have to train. And this game I played against one of my, uh, one of my trainers at the time. I was, I think, uh, not even eight yet. And we had some training games. So I wanted to show you already, even a very young age, I had already my tactical skills already a little polished, but of course I had a long way to go there. And I'd like to challenge you with my first question here. So the first question will be, you can see that uh, I'm trying to give a check on G. How can you stop the black king to escape on C7? Is it queen F4? Is it bishop F4? or rook g8. So I'd like you to think about this answer and click on the solution which you believe that it was the correct one. I definitely wanted to give check checkmate to my opponent. So I'm going to have the answers later and then we can move on to our next, next question. So thanks for your answers. Let's see on the board, what did I play? I played bishop f4. This is the right answer. And the reason is because this way I stopped the sneak out, the escape way of the king to c7. I do leave my queen there, but black cannot take my queen because then with the rook, I go to the back rank and actually it's checkmate. So black didn't have anything better than he played rook c6 covering the line of my bishop on a4, which actually I took on e6, black took on e6, and then rook g8 check, which means that in the next move, I will be taking the rook on a8. So this was one of the example, which was from a very early age. I just wanted to share with you a nice technical idea, which I played when I was young. 
And then, of course, later on, quite a few years after that, in uh, it, this was 1986, this picture was made in uh, at the New York Open, where I played in the unrated section. The New York Open, it was a big event with, I think, eight or nine uh, sections. And I was just nine years old without rating points, but where I played, I had some strong opponents because actually there was one person from uh, Yugoslavia who lost all his rating to be able to compete in the tournament because actually it was first prize was a thousand dollars. And, uh, but I don't know how, but I was already pretty good. I won seven games, the first seven games, and I drew the last one because I knew that I secure my first uh, place there. And what you can see, I'm wearing a chess sweater. You don't see exactly, but actually my mother was knitting it. And there is a big uh, rook on it. And uh, this was my lucky sweater. So this was lucky sweater. It was four days of tournament, two rounds every day. And we were living far away. We were uh, playing in the Penta Hotel at the time. And we had a morning game. There, is, there was a break and then in the afternoon again, there was a game. And so this was my lucky winning sweater at the time. And in between games, I was taking a nap or relax at some area of the hotel where uh, there were chairs and no people. So we were lying down with Sophia on the floor, relaxing and play in the next game. But I would like to show you a position from this tournament. And actually here I played against Simic, my opponent, you can see in this position that actually black has one extra pawn. But after all, it, uh, it is very clear in this game, but also in my later games, that I was always happy to give up material, especially pawns to open up the lines. And here you can see that black king is pretty vulnerable. So my question will be the next question, the next quiz question, which I would like to ask from you. What would you play with white? How would you continue white's attack? Queen F6 check, Rook takes H7, sacrificing the Rook, or just play Rook D3 and continue the attack. I'm curious, what do you going? What are you going to be choosing? Because I was very happy that I could do something which the kind of pattern I was learning already and knew these patterns. So it's very important that you practice. And of course, I was solving a lot of tactical things. Rook h7, you guys are really good. Rook h7, it's clear that uh, you know what you're talking about, right? Rook h7, I was really happy all my life to sacrifice or winning a game with some sacrifice to give up material in order to give checkmate. King, rook takes h7. King takes h7. Then I played rook d3 in order to give mate on h3, right? So black practically cannot do anything else than to play bishop g3, covering the opportunity for the rook to go to h3, but I was simply taking rook takes h3. Now queen g7 is one mate threat, queen h5, queen h4, rook h3. So actually everything is uh, mate. So black had to give up his queen on g3, but then I had the queen up and within a few moves, it was uh, resigned by Buck. So I'd like to show you a funny painting and I will have a question to this. So my next question will be, but you take a look a bit. And then my question is, what can you recognize from the artwork? Which opening can it be? Unfortunately, I didn't make it right my, my slide because now you don't see it. So I really need your good memory, what you've seen in the position. So I'm sorry about that if I didn't give you enough time. But uh, there are chess pieces on the position and it's a very typical opening setup. And I'm very curious how many of you will know the right answer because actually it's, yeah, you said, okay. Well, actually it's the Benoni. It's the Benoni is the right answer. That's correct. And I like this uh, painting because I think in general in life also, it very much depends how much knowledge we have. And according to the knowledge, that's how we assess a situation. 
whether it's a chess position or a situation in life, it's always important to know a lot about the topic when we make judgments. Actually, this is the position which I see there, and this is the Benoni. So visual thinking is something very important in, uh, in chess, and this we can also develop it quite a bit. Let's see our next slide. You can see me actually receiving the gold medal in the Chess Olympiad in 1988. This was the first Chess Olympiad I've ever played. This time I played in the ladies section together with my sisters, which was amazing to play together with my sisters. We had also model Ildiko, a Hungarian, very talented girl. So we had four players in the team. We were always playing three boards at a time. And here on the left side, you see the person, the gentleman in mustache. He was a very famous chess grandmaster, world-class player, Gligorich. And he was also very famous to being a gentleman as a human being, but also on the chessboard. And uh, of course, this Olympiad was something very exceptional for me as being a gold medal for Hungary together with my sisters being in one team. This is something, of course, one of the biggest milestones in my life. But I would like to show you also one game from here, because actually I uh, won 12 games out of 13 and I made one draw in the tournament. Actually, later on, if you have the time, please join me with my talk with Gary Kasparov later today. And where actually we are talking about uh, this Olympiad where we met for the first time. And it was something very special for me, but uh, actually he's also sharing how positive it was for him because actually Soviet Union won the gold medal as well. So here I sacrificed the piece already, and it is very clear that where you see the red square, that square is very weak for black. So actually if I would have my bishop on the long diagonal, I could give a checkmate. But you have to figure out what was the reason that I gave up a piece. I sacrificed the piece already. My rook on the E file is very strong. And I'd like to challenge you. What do you think? How to win with white? I sacrificed the piece for an attack. How did you continue? How would you like to continue this? Rook E3, Queen F8, or maybe something else. You have something better. And we are going to see some of the results very shortly. This game, actually, I also not only won the game and scored a full point, but also this game won the best game prize of the whole Olympiad in 88. And yeah, most of you, cool, great, Queen F8, you have all your tactical skills. So I, I see that uh, you are going into my footsteps. Of course, let's see on the board, how does it go after Queen F8? Because after Queen F8, this is the right move. Black has to take, capture the queen. And then I will be going Bishop to H6. Black has no other move than King G8. And then Rook E8 checkmate. So this is uh, very clear that Black had not defense because of the bad development. And actually, of course, when I talk about milestones, of course, it is, it is something special to have the sisters who I have. Susan was who you see on the left side. She was always mentoring me. She was always very supportive. She was always uh, supportive, not only in general, but also when actually I took over and I had started to have higher rating. And even before, when I was only very clearly talented, she was always saying, oh, my little sister will be much better than I am. And this was, of course, something very unique and something very important that the three of us always supported each other. In the middle, we see Sophia. And on the right hand side, it's, it's me. Uh, Sophia, she's a real artist in the family. She also makes a lot of graphics and she was uh, giving up chess uh, earlier than we did with Susan and, and myself. Uh, she's very artistic. She's always smiling. She's, uh, she helped me a lot in the creating the educational program. 
So not only in the, in the, in the creative way with her graphics, but also with uh, her thoughts and critics and uh, everything, with her honest opinions. And uh, so it is something very special for us, the way we grew up together. And even now that we are all different parts of the world, Sophia lives in Israel, Susan in the US, myself, I stayed here in Hungary. Uh, still, of course, we, they, uh, we keep daily contact and uh, this is something very special for us. But the title why I put the Olympic champions Bulgaria, because in 1990, just two years after the previous Olympiad, which we were talking about, I uh, we repeated. I, did, I played well, but not as well as in 88. But anyway, it was a repetition and we won twice the gold medal together. In 91, it was a very special occasion for me as I completed the third Grandmaster Norm in my career. And uh, I was breaking Bobby Fischer's record with this performance. And the picture you see actually is one of my favorite pictures from this time because you see myself analyzing with my opponent, Tolnay, Hungarian, a very creative, talented youngster. Well, he was like 20 something at the time, I think, or maybe already 30. And this was last round and I was playing with the black pieces and I won. And I'd like to share with you the game we played. In this position, it's very complicated. It's incredibly complicated and I don't want to challenge you for a long time with this. But I made, I mean, you can see White's last move was F takes E5. We were exchanging a pair of pawns. But, okay, what can Black do? Right? There are different uh, moves to be considered. And in Sicilian, when there are very complicated pawn structures, practically there is all the pieces which are on the board. So I will ask you, what do you think? What kind of unexpected move I had? So I'm going to have the question again so you can, uh, you can answer me. Can you find the unexpected move I have played? My opponent didn't realize that this is a possibility. And actually, this was the idea for me to play F takes E5, F takes E5. And then I had something in mind. Is it knight E4, knight C4, or possibly queen E5 just capturing the pawn? Think about it that there are some tricky ideas. I love the knights. This I can help. With this way, I can help you because knight is my favorite piece because it can go all the way with all kinds of unexpected jumps. Okay. I see the result and uh, more people like to play knight c4. And the idea is that if whatever takes the knight, the pawn or the bishop, then I just take back with my d5 pawn and the bishop opens up. And after this, I won the game, which was, uh, of course, very special for me and also for my family. And worldwide, people started to know that I became the youngest, at the time, youngest grandmaster. And then I would like to uh, move on with the next picture. And I love this picture to tell you the truth. If you look closely, you will find a lot of fantastic characters and top players, top of the top. And you can find me in the middle. This tournament was played, I think, uh, if I remember exactly, 93. And you can see next to me on my right hand side, I mean, if you see the picture, Vishwanathan Anand, just behind me, Kasparov. Next to him, it was Polugayevsky, a very uh, famous world-class player from older generations. Then next to him, it was Nigel Short, Yusupov. Then next to Yusupov is Anatoly Karpov, Galfan, Timon, Salov. And who is sitting next to me is Mickey Adams, and next to him is Kamsky. So practically who you see on this picture, you can also see on the right-hand side, Kasparov, it's Vladimir Kramnik when he was just uh, 16 or 17, something like that. That was the first time I met him. And uh, so, I mean, chess is a de male dominated chess world, right? I mean, it's no question about it. It was back then and even now it is. So, but I think I, I have a character which suited very much to this world. And I always like challenges. I always like uh, to challenge myself primary. And, um, but this was a very special event for me where uh, I felt that I grew 
and uh, I gained respect. And actually, I want to show you from this event one position which I was playing against Timman. And you have to visualize it that this tournament was played in the Champs Elysees Theatre, which is fully booked. And in those times, you had the commentary where you had earplugs and there was commentary. On the stage of the Champs Elysees Theatre, there was only one small podium where the two players, the chessboard, and with the lights, it was just there. And uh, it was a very special atmosphere. We had to go like an hour before, like you go to make a performance, right? Everything was so professional and it was like 92 actually. I mean, so many years ago, like 30 years ago almost, and I still have such a beautiful memories on the organi organizing uh, aspect of it as well. And actually in this tournament, when I played Jan Timman, after the tournament, he was very angry and very upset because he did not think at all that I'm going to be beating him. And this was a knockout tournament, so it meant that he had to go home while I stayed. And now I want to challenge you that I was playing with the black pieces. If we count the pawns, white has two extra pawns. And white was not, not really uh, afraid of my checks because the king would be going sneaking out. Sorry about this to have the question first. No problem. Is it white is winning, black is winning, or is it a dead draw? Actually, evaluation is something very difficult in, uh, in chess. I think this is one of the most important things which uh, we have to deal in our life when we, uh, how to decide, how to evaluate, how much do you have to calculate in order to understand well the things. And, uh, and here Timman got a huge surprise. I think there is a mix of feelings about the evaluation of the position, but it also, I think I didn't give you enough time explanations showing on the screen the position, but you can look back. I'm sure you can find it on YouTube maybe, but also in the databases. And my next move, let's see what I've played. And I played the move G4. And the idea is that I don't allow the white king to go to H3 and G4. Now the bishop check, g1 or from f4 is a huge threat. But of course, after making this move, my opponent Jan Timman, who later on became my training partner, and I have a huge respect for him, I also gave him a Goodwill Ambassador Award from my foundation for uh, art in chess, because he's an extremely great chess player, but he's an extremely and unique artist, chess artist, on the chessboard because he's composing a lot of beautiful studies which i can suggest you to look in his books actually he just gave out uh, published a new book about his games but also he has excellent books on studies and they are beautiful beautiful so after white takes on g4 capturing the pawn bishop gives the check so now after the check, white cannot go to h3 because there is this g4 white pawn which is in the way. So after rook h1, it's just a checkmate. White played g3. I took with the pawn on g3. White went king g2. But of course, such a pawn on g3 is deadly dangerous, especially combining having such a great black color bishop, rook f2. Now white had to move out, he went king g1, and I simply, without thinking and hesitating too much, I just played rook a2, and then the next move white cannot do anything against bishop e3, because if the bishop uh, move is uh, protected with rook b3, then I just going to take on a7 the knight. So let's see another great memory of mine when I was playing a match against Boris Basket. This was something exceptional for me. This was in 93, beginning of the year, something February, because it's just a few months after the rematch between Boris Basket and Bobby Fischer. And that was, of course, the whole world was talking about it. I was following it and it was like, oh my God, this is something really special going on in the world. And it meant also that, of course, Spassky was not so uh, strong anymore as in his prime years, but it was very clear that he took the match very seriously, already the rematch with Bobby, and also my match. So he had a second, he was preparing, he was focusing, his mindset was there, 
And we played a 10 game match in Budapest. And it was uh, played in a ballroom of one of the biggest hotels. So daily we had in those days, people had their pocket chest set while sitting. And uh, we had about a thousand people uh, there live. So it was very special. And uh, it was a very good timing in my life uh, in, in that time. I was just 17 years old. And uh, you can see on the picture also the 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 respect, the action. It was actually a post-mortem analysis after a game. But I want to show you one of my games with him, which actually, I, if I remember well, this was game two. And uh, but in this game, it's actually an analysis position because if knight e7, he would be making knight e7. I have a very tricky question for you. So watch out, you can memorize this position because white has a winning move in one move. Actually, it's two move combination. But there are big temptations to play other moves. So let's see the question. What is the best move for white? This is my question. Bishop d8, bishop e5, or d6? Because actually you can, you can feel it that the position is winning, right? White has an extra pawn, white is more active, the h7 queen is very dangerous, and it's white to move, which is very important. So let's see how do you decide what is the killing move in this position? Well, actually, bishop e5 is the move. And I think I will leave you with the homework that if you look back this position, which we are going to get back on the screen, then it means that bishop d8 would be a mistake. It would be a mistake. And you know what? I leave you with this to figure out how can black save himself if I would go bishop d8, okay? So this is something to, to make you think for the day. The winning move would be bishop takes e5 with a very nice pattern where if black goes, goes king e5 or if he takes with the queen, it does not matter because white is going to be playing a little check on h8 and wherever the king is moving away, then queen e5 wins. This match was something very special for me. So if you're an amateur player and you're interested in nice games, I also have a book, which is a trilogy. It was a great journey for me that also to write more than 1000 pages of my uh, memories from the very, very young age. And I have quite a few games uh, included there and I write about my uh, thoughts and how I experienced it. But all the games we played, it was such a challenging, a lot of interesting ideas. Even the games we played draw, I loved them because there were so many ideas. He was also such a creative, interesting player that it was one of the best match in my life. And I can tell you that it's not only because, uh, because I won, because later on I had an incredible match, which I lost against Anand in 2003 in Mainz. And that also it was a competition where I remember with, uh, with great memory. But about that, I'm not talking. Let's move on to my other great memory. This was a real milestone in my career, Madrid 94. And I love this picture because this was taken right before the closing ceremony. And uh, it was in May. It was the first tournament I won, which was category 16, which is uh, around 2600 uh, competition. We had some strong players, strong uh, Russian uh, players also playing there. And of course I was just a girl, talented girl. People knew that, okay, she's good, good, but not that good. And uh, in this tournament, it was exactly the last day or the last before day of my mother's birthday. And my mother told me before the event, well, you know what, why don't you win the tournament? It would be such a nice birthday present for me. And actually I did. And now in this picture, you can see she was thanking for me her birthday present. And then another turning point in my life, this is not exactly on the chessboard, but I think is the most important move in life. Who is going to be your partner? And here you see uh, my future husband, Gustav, 
And we were visiting here in 98, we met and we got married in 2000. But this was the beautiful trip we were visiting uh, the Machu Picchu. And uh, actually this was the occasion when after visiting and going around and I got burned and it was exhausting day, of course, on a very high, so you, you barely get the uh, opportunity to breathe. And then on the way back on the train, um, with the cows, with the chickens, with the goats, with all the noise and smell and the beautiful uh, breathtaking view, my husband does my hand. And this was, this was the situation when uh, the first move in order to get married. So of course, this was a huge turning point in my life. And ever since she was, he was extremely supportive in my career. And uh, it's, it's definitely, uh, if he wouldn't be so, so supportive, I wouldn't, maybe I would stop earlier playing chess, but also I gained and I became much more stable and a better player in the years. Only in 2003 that I got in the top 10. And then of course, uh, the big champions. I mean, big champions always give a lot to someone's uh, career. And I think it is something very important to highlight that uh, when a youngster, a talented young personality who loves the game, who is very passionate about the game, it is exceptionally important to look and search for opportunities to meet the big guys, the guys who really understand all the ins and outs, the guys who are real champions. Because even if you just spend a few minutes, I remember when I was a kid and I had an opportunity to visit the tournament and just look at them after the game, making a post-mortem, you think the same way or you don't, but you see someone just talking in a natural way and looking on the board how fast they are, what kind of ideas come to mind, how they talk, how they behave. And uh, this is something essential in the growth of a talented player. That's definitely something very important. And I was fortunate that I met uh, Kasparov, for example, when I was 12. And then later on, I met Karpov, I met other players, which meant a lot uh, to improve my chess and to stay ambitious and to keep my uh, motivation and everything. Here, actually, this is a picture from, I think, uh, around year 2000, where uh, I think we were packed already with all the luggage and we were waiting the, the taxi to come and we were just playing blades at the lobby. As, as Carpo, for example, what I've learned from him, there's a lot to learn from him, of course, about his chest. You can see his games, the, the sensitivity he had on where to put the pieces, how to play strategically, how to play a long, 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 long day, game and torture the opponent and eventually even win drawish positions. So this was something uh, very special to learn, but it is very clear that one I've learned a lot that uh, he is a player. He's a player by all means. He loves to play, whether it's blitz, it's cards, it's the, the flippers uh, game. He's a real player. He's an exceptionally passionate about games and to win in the games he's playing. So this is what I learned from him. But I want to share with you one of the games I played against him, which was very important because it was very difficult for me to score a full point against Carpo. At the same time, I played the match with him in 1998, which I'm very proud of in some ways. But on the other hand, I'm not proud of it because the games didn't have that special quality, which I had, for example, against uh, Spassky. And uh, I want to share with you, instead of from that match, which I won in a rapid match, I want to share with you a tournament played in Holland, in Hohoven. I'm not sure my pronunciation is perfect, from 2003, where it was very unusual that I could show my uh, pattern recognition skill, which actually, when I was a child of age of nine, I'm pretty sure I solved lots of typical puzzles. And I would never think that I can experience it and show it in a real game, not other than the world champion Anatoly Karpov. And I think this could have happened only because he already started to have time travel and he just, it was a blockout or something that he didn't notice how I would be, make my killing attacks. So my question is, 
to think this position, what did I play? How did I make use of my bishop pair? Bishop h7, sacrifice my bishop, continue the attack with queen h5, or just give my other bishop up with bishop g7. It's a very typical pattern how to destroy the king's setup, the king uh, structure. And this is something very important because if you have two bishops on these two diagonals, it can be a killer, especially if you have a teamwork with your queen and rook. So I said a lot about the game already. Okay, so most of you did the best move which I played. It was bishop h7, king h7, queen h5 check, king g8. So now take a look at the position. Some of you who choose bishop h7, I have the feeling that you have already in mind all the way through the forcing winning move, but I'd like to ask the next question from you. How do you continue the game? Let's see the next question. And we're going to see the question will be, how did you follow the game? Well, until we get the questions, the quiz question, until then you can think and you see the board. So let's see, what did I have in mind when I sacked my first bishop on h7? Let's see what would you play, because it is also very important when you have a winning position, when you have a winning combination, how to continue, how to go all the way until to really score the point. This is also very challenging for amateurs, but also for myself. On the highest level, it's always a question. And I think this is one of the biggest strengths of Magnus. Of course, he has a lot. But uh, one of the biggest strengths that if he gets a chance, if he gets a winning position, he wins it. So let's see the move on the board. Let's see, Bishop G7. And most of you, most of you knew it exactly how to finish the game. So after the move, bishop g7, we are going to see it in my next slide. And it's just on the board, bishop g7, the threat is queen h8 mate. So black rook on g7, I make rook g3 check, and black is actually going to get mated just in a move or two if king f6, queen g5 mate. So this was something very special, and I remember it was uh, in the newspapers in Holland also that... Uh, it was so unusual that Karpov was losing this way, but it can happen, especially when you have uh, time trouble and uh, your position is not so good and you're confused. But uh, of course, it was um, it was uh, a nice combination, which I remember with uh, with nice memory. So then another milestone, of, uh, milestone in my life, obviously, when you start to have a family and here you see Oliver with me, he's already, well, in this picture, he was about one year old. He was born in 2014, so he's 16 by now. And uh, he's a lovely boy. I'm very proud of him. And uh, well, he was eating pieces as I did when I was a baby. Later on, he was a little bit uh, playing chess in competition. But then uh, he stopped and retired from chess, competitive chess much earlier than I did. He was playing chess in kindergarten. He was also playing chess in elementary school, grade one and two. And then later uh, he quit. But I do hope that in a later stage of his life, when he's going to have his family, then chess somehow comes in back to in his life. So let's see a game which I want to share with you. In 2005, this was the first tournament after my baby boy Oliver was born. He was about six months old. I was at home. Uh, of course, he was a typical little guy, little boy who was waking up in the night. So when I was traveling away to Vekanze, which maybe some of you know where it's, it's in Holland, it's very cold in January, it's on the seaside but it has a very unique and special atmosphere. And uh, I've been playing there uh, many times. It's a huge festival 
and uh, it's a very little village where during the festival all the pubs restaurants they have chess boards so actually really chess connects there everything in that uh, few weeks of the event but it can be also very freezing cold so this tournament was very memorable for me and it was a very serious challenge milestone in my life because actually this was i think even not only the first tournament but this was the first round i played against Fiddler. And I want to challenge you with my question because I made the move and Black resigned. It was not the only winning move, I must say, but I will have my question just shown to you on the screen. First question, is it C4 that I play? Is it Queen D3 or Bishop F5 attacking the Queen? So I'm looking forward for your answer about what was the the move which after Swidler resigned and of course in the meantime i can tell you that uh, after six months of not playing com actually it was more than six months that i didn't play in competition but after giving birth it's um, you don't know what to expect from yourself of course priorities change a bit and uh, and also which was uh, interesting that i felt like i went to a vacation where actually vacan z tournament is not about vacation i must tell you it's like 13 rounds, 13 rounds and uh, which is uh, very tough because very tough event the a group where all the top players are playing so it's a long event but just that i could get a good night's sleep i had a quiet breakfast and i could only focus on myself this is something very new again. So let's see on the board. Most of you played the move which I played. Also, Queen D3 was actually a very good move, but C4 actually just wins on the spot because there is a pin also on the D5. But the main idea is that the Queen is attacking the Bishop on B3 and Bishop D5 is threatening to winning the Queen. So if Black plays Bishop C4, I'm sorry, I didn't put it on the on the diagram, then rook would capture the bishop, and then bishop d5 would win the queen. And then another turning point, my lovely Hannah was born in 2006, just two years after Oliver. And this made my life even uh, more happy and more challenging. And I want to show you later on what had happened. Actually, this, this exact picture which you see right here this was the first time that i beat gary kasparov but i have to tell you which may, may sound quite strange for you this is not the game which i'm most proud of and i want to show you which i'm most proud of which game was most interesting for me and it's getting a little bit more complicated the last few examples which I want to share with you. But this is also something that you can look back in many YouTube videos, in books, in my books as well. This was something very special. I just want to say about the psychology of, of the challenge with Kasparov. I met him back in 88. Of course, he's God. You see, you meet Kasparov, the world champion. And of course, I was rooting for him when he was playing the match and becoming the world champion. He has a very similar style to mine. And uh, in this game, we played in Linares 2001. And I realized it, that actually my position is not good. I understood if I just capture the pawn with the pawn, then F takes E5, Bishop E5, I have a pawn down, I have not enough attack. I will just lose the game. So I said, okay, I found the move, which I said, wow, I want to confuse Gary. So my question is to you, what would you play? What kind of surprising move? What to do when you're in trouble? Make a surprising move. So my question is not to calculate or anything. Just tell me how is your intuition? Did I play F5 giving up a piece? Did I play C3 or Knight takes G7? So let me know your move. What do you think? Unless you know the game and you know what I played. To give surprises to opponent, it is also a great strategy. Of course, sometimes you don't have surprising moves, but when you do, sometimes if you have a difficult position, then it's better to make a surprising move, especially if your opponent has time travel, let's say. So let's see what I played. And I played C3. 
And C3 was something which we are going to see in the board just in a second. It was a move which actually Gary was a little surprised, but he was sure that he's winning. And actually he was right because he has a great sense of understanding of the game. And of course I have so far only one knight on H5. But now I want to show you another game. I think uh, I got the question earlier than I wanted. Yes, exactly. Thank you. I'm having this position. I wanted to show you just a few moves later. There was another crucial point of the game. For now, I gave up the piece already. I gave up my bishop. And the little problem can be with the black king on g8. But still, the question is how to, how to attack it, right? And in this position, black's last move was g6. And in this position, Gary was hesitating to play g6. And while he was hesitating, I had my plan already. I had my plan. And when he played g6, without thinking, I played my next move. Without thinking. I was not sure that it's going to be sound. I didn't know whether it's good, whether I can save the game or potentially maybe win the game. I knew one thing, that I wanted to play against Gary's king. This was my whole strategy in the whole game whatever it takes, whatever the cost is. And actually so far I sacrificed one piece and now I did some more. And it was very interesting because by this time Gary took off his jacket. He usually took off his watch and like he was really watching in the game. He was in the, in the board and we started to have not too much time. And instantly I made my next move. So we are going to have the question. I want you to be choosing between the different alternatives. By now, actually, I got a chance to save myself. I was not aware of it, but uh, I analyzed it uh, later. But how should I go f5? Should I go knight e6 or rook g1 to pin the king on g8? So the question is, how do you decide f5, knight e6, rook g1? I was really proud of this game because it was so challenging and Gary was in great form also. And after all, this was a classical game. And when I beat Gary in 2002, a year later, that was only a rapid game. And in that game, he played the Berlin attack, uh, Berlin defense, which is absolutely not his style. In this game, he was playing a game which is absolutely his style. He was absolutely in good form and he was absolutely an expert in the Sicilian in that opening. So this is why I have a much stronger feeling to this game, even though it ended up only in draw. So let's see the move F5 I played. And I gave up my knight also, and I'm not going to show you all the way. I just want to show you that F5 was the move I played instantly. Gary was confused, furious, what is really going on. He spent some time of his, and actually we had a perpetual check. And now I want to show you the last example, which is connected to Magnus Carlsen. I think we are having one of the most interesting world champion, and he's a great world champion, I must say. This was at the London Eye back when I was still in competition and I was playing in the London Chess Classic, and we made the picture there. But we also met quite a few times over the board, and I want to show you one of the examples I played against him, it was in Mexico 2012. He was not the world champion yet, but he had the strengths and he was extremely powerful. And uh, well, I think we can say confidently everybody felt it that he is sometime going to actually be the world champion. And actually he did become world champion. I think it was 2014, if I remember the correct year. But here in this position, I like this position not only because I won against Magnus, but also because it's a fully packed chessboard, right? Only a few pawns are missing. And it shows so well that the board can be huge, but still everything has a connection one to another. And in my next move, what I've played, I just, last move was F3, which was a losing move, you know? So I want you to have the question, what do you do with black? What is the winning move? So the question is, how did I take advantage of the unprotected rook on e1? Is it queen h4, g4, or bishop takes d5? So let me know what you think about it. 
What is your answer? Maybe if you haven't seen my game, it's not easy at all how these patterns work in chess, on the chessboard. It was a rapid game. So it was something very difficult, but I couldn't believe my eyes how it worked out actually. So let's see your choice. Okay, the best move which I made, let's see on the board, it's queen h4. It is queen h4 and the, the reason is because after queen h4, white has to move away his rook, no other way of protecting. I went, bishop takes d5, and actually I won the game. After c takes d5, I went knight takes d5, and because of the pin horizontally, this is the problem of white. So I won a piece actually. And then of course my final milestone is the Global Chess Festival, which we are having right now, right here, and this year only online. I do hope that you enjoyed my journey, sharing with you my milestones, my biggest milestones of my life. I'm very proud of it that I have quite a few important steps, chess and of chess steps and of the board steps, which is very important. I hope you enjoyed it and enjoy the day. And don't forget to come back for the interesting interview. So talk with Gary and I.